Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming back after dinner, um, or lunch even. Uh, we appreciate people being here. So uh, we're here to talk about a bunch of Apple EFI research that we did. Um, and this is actually uh, a recently updated version of the work. Uh, we released some of this uh, back in October time. And we've updated a lot of this for the High Sierra release and a lot of the changes that came in with 10.13. So uh, a bunch of new content in here today, as well as a bunch of analysis on uh, some of the APIs that we released to help with some of the problems that we've identified. And we can um, uh, get a lot of information out from the usage of those APIs that we hope is going to be interesting as well. So who are we? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Pepin Brian. I'm an R&D engineer with uh, Duo. I work uh, in the uh, Duo Labs group. Um, I do uh, R&D, uh, obviously, because of my title. Um, I like to reverse engineer and break things that are Apple, specifically Mac OS stuff. Um, also, a recovering Mac admin, which um, uh, explains why I want to break Macs. Um, and I also maintain a couple of open source tools that are used uh, pretty frequently along, among the uh, Mac admin crowd. And my name, Rich Smith, a little bit easier to remember than Pepine's name. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I spend my time between New York, uh, Detroit, and Reykjavik. It's actually the first time I've been back to the UK in many, many years. So it's nice to be back, at least for like 36 hours before I run away again. Uh, so I'm director of R&D at Duo Labs. Uh, Duo Labs is the research arm of Duo Security, which you probably know for kind of Duo Push and a lot of uh, multi-factor authentication stuff. Uh, also co-founder of Syndis, which is a, a red team company out of Iceland. Um, my research tends to be around uh, post-exploitation, a lot of frameworks in that space. I enjoy firmware, obviously, uh, Python, and like some large-scale, internet-scale research studies where we're looking at empirical data. So enough about us, as you get into the work. So before we dig into the details, what's kind of the TLDR? Like, what was in our heads when we started this work, when we actually start to put a lot of time into this? So at conferences like Black Hat, like DEF CON, um, CCC, there's been loads of great EFI vulnerabilities that have been worked on. Like lots of great offensive work that has been done, finding lots of problems. We were interested in then, how are those vendor responses that address those problems making it in reality? Like, who was actually patching the issues that had been found? And when those patches were released, how well were they getting applied into the real world? So that was really what started our, our work here and, and, and led the approach that we took. And really extending out from EFI uh, security, um, we really wanted to extend a lot of questions that we had around uh, how firmware security mapped up against software security. So over the last number of years, there's been a lot of uh, mantra around kind of keep things patched, pushing on vendors to actually release updates in a timely manner. And you know, the mantra that a lot of people get is if you're keeping your things up to date, you're going to be running faster than most bears. You're going to be OK. If you're going to do nothing else, keep things up to date. We wanted to measure how well that actually um, maps to firmware space. So we feel software security has got to a much better place than it has been in terms of the availability and um, how well people are, are going about installing the patches. Uh, we wanted to ask a lot of the similar questions about firmware security and see whether it was kind of on par with software security or it was falling well behind. So the super TLDR on the, a lot of the research that we did, we analyzed all of the OS uh, security updates that Apple had released really over the last three to four years from 10.10 .10 through to 10.13. This gives us an insight into what was being fixed at the EFI and firmware layer. Then we also got uh, data from more than 73,000 real world systems. Um, and then we were able to map the uh, efficacy of what Apple had released to what was actually deployed in the wild. Um, and as we'll go into how Apple releases its EFI updates, it's very closely bound to the software updates that it releases. So we should have a one-to-one -one map in between the expected state of security software and the expected state of the security of the firmware. Um, we found quite divergent states, and that what, that's what led to a lot of our other work. But this was really the TLDR for what drove a lot of our research, the comparison between firmware security and software security, and trying to make sure that we understood how well patches that had been released were actually landing on real boxes. Um, which brings us to our next question. Why Apple? Like, why are we ragging on Apple for this? Well, we're not. In, in reality, it turns out we're pretty lazy researchers. Um, Apple controls the whole stack. So they control uh, hardware right the way through to software, um, obviously including the firmware in between. And this vertical integration that Apple controls gives us a much more manageable data set to answer some of these questions by. On the Wintel side of the world, um, it's, it's definitely more fragmented. Um, it's a much more heterogeneous environment. 
And, and that just means that the data anal uh, analysis that we do is much more complex. So we got lazy. We started off with the easy data set. There is nothing to say that the work that we've done doesn't apply equally to the Wintel world. And from the, the small amount of work that we've done in the Wintel space, we believe, strongly believe that the state of EFI security in the Wintel world is much, much, much worse than in the Apple world. Um, we spoke with Apple from the earliest days of our findings, so way back in kind of June um, of this year. Um, they've been great to work with. They've responded very well. They've built up a world-class firmware security team at Apple. So we actually believe, despite some of the issues that we have found, they're actually leading the way with the way that vendors are thinking about EFI security in particular, um, and the way that they're going about trying to keep their firmware um, in, in lockstep with their software and with respect to security. So, yep, we ragged on Apple, but that wasn't really the point. Uh, and the reason that we focused on Apple was it was the easiest data set for us to analyze. So, quick overview of what we're gonna cover. We're gonna take you through kind of uh, an EFI 101. We're, we're aware that not everybody is super, super familiar with EFI. Um, we're gonna talk about some Apple specifics on EFI as well, how um, the updates are applied, how things are reflashed. Um, and just essentially give you some context around which the work is based. Then we're gonna dig into the newer work, you know, what we did, what we found, what you can do, and, and things that we've released to try and make your lives a little bit uh, easier and um, gather more information about the problem as well in the course of that. So, over to Papine. So, <clears throat> hopefully I don't have to go into too, much, uh, too great detail uh, as far as what EFI does, what it stands for, Extensible Firmware Interface. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll run through this pretty quickly. I want to focus on uh, how Apple uh, has been using this uh, so far. Um, so I think we're pretty aware that EFI is running on a lot of devices nowadays as part of the, uh, the uh, lower level management systems that uh, are you know, part of many uh, uh, systems these days. Um, so Intel um, started working on uh, their, their version of EFI in the mid 1990s to replace the uh, aging and severely lacking BIOS, uh, lacking for a number of reasons. Uh, it was 32-bit, had very limited uh, storage cap capabilities. It was generally time for a replacement. Uh, they worked on that for a little bit, and then in uh, 2005, the U UEFI uh, standard was, uh, was uh, initiated. Uh, Intel joined the uh, UEFI group to uh, add their work uh, that they had already done to uh, come up with the uh, unified uh, EFI standard. And, um, Apple, as such, uh, started using uh, EFI for their own products in uh, 2006. Um, why was that? Why did a Apple actually need to switch or chose to switch? So um, 2006, if you remember, is also the, the year that the first uh, Intel-powered uh, Mac shipped. So Apple needed to make some other major changes uh, besides the, uh, the lower-level systems they were using. They could no longer use uh, open firmware. Uh, which was at that point a, a PowerPC leg leg legacy, so they couldn't really um, make that work. Uh, that wasn't part of the Intel platform. So they switched to EFI, um, first models of chip, iMac, a MacBook Pro, and, and that quickly uh, uh, spread to all the other systems. Um, and it needs to support um, a number of Mac-specific things like uh, NetBoot, which is where you hold down a key, and it will actually find a network uh, boot uh, very similar to a Pixie, and also Internet Restore, which is a, a sort of an Internet-powered version version of that. And um, it is just like uh, uh, open firmware and any other of these systems were in the past. It is entirely invisible to end users. So they, uh, most users are not aware that this is even a thing or something they, uh, they need to, uh, to care about. Why should they care? So why should they care? It's a good question. So from an attacker's perspective, why is EFI even an interesting target to attack? Um, and it kind of, for me, breaks down to these three areas. Um, Earlier, there was an earlier talk today uh, with uh, discussing a lot of the Intel ME background, and there was a much prettier uh, pyramid on that, talking about the various levels of, of, of the system interface. Um, with respect to EFI, the, the important thing is, is this here, like where this sits beneath the applications and the OS, and even the hypervisor. So ring three and ring zero are the traditional Intel protection rings that we've, that we've heard about. These kind of made up rings, rings minus one, minus two, minus three, depending on whose model that you're using, um, really are just indicating layers of the system which operate beneath the traditional protection ring layers. And the lower down this stack you go, the more information that you can get from the upper layers. Anything low down should be able to, with a small number of caveats, access anything above it. Um, there are uh, interfaces that uh, allow higher levels to get access to some of the information from the lower, uh, lower level interfaces, um, but they tend to be much more restrictive. 
So if you've successfully attacked EFI, if you've managed to get your code running in EFI, this means that you can affect and um, interrogate anything at the layer above it. To the TLDR of this would be you can effectively read or write any memory location or any disk location with a couple of caveats around SMM, um, Intel ME uh, uh, within the stack. So if you're running a compromised EFI, you've kind of got keys to the kingdom. So from an attacker's perspective, um, you can do most anything if you've managed to get your code running in the EFI level. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, then there's these two other aspects which are actually really quite key to this. The, the stealth aspect of EFI is if you've compromised somebody's EFI, it's actually incredibly difficult for them to tell. It's not impossible, but the amount of work that's required to determine that you have a compromised EFI is significant. A lot of that becomes the security software that people are using are, is either happening at ring, ring three or ring zero. From those layers, essentially EFI running at two layers beneath that can lie. Um, any introspection that will be coming from those layers of the system, EFI, if, it, if it's trying to be evasive, could, could lie to those higher level layers of the system and enables it to be very stealthy. Um, if you pull the chip off the board and, and interrogate the contents of the, the speed flash, then, yep, you could start to diff out and see that you were running code that you probably weren't expecting to. But that level of uh, introspection requires physical access to a system. You know, very, very difficult compared to most other compromises to realize that you're running compromised EF, EFI code. And then, oh, equally, the, the persistence part. If I've managed to get my attack code into the EFI layer, um, it's pretty difficult to remove me. So often people will say things like, you know, reinstall your OS. Well, that's not going to remove me from, from the, uh, the EFI portion because I'm in SpyFlash. Um, it's also if you completely rip out the disk and put a new disk in, I'm still in the flash. So the persistence level combined with the stealth level combined with the ability to access um, most every aspect of the system actually makes EFI attra attacks very attractive for um, sophisticated adversaries. And this is why we've seen a lot of research in the space because once you've got this, it kind of is keys to the kingdom. But the caveat really is um, who would want to attack EFI? This is, this is not a script kiddie um, uh, situation. We're not going to see this as part of drive-by web browser attacks. This, you know, well-funded adversaries, so in the same breath that we're saying kind of nation states and industrial espionage, this is the kind of tool, sophisticated targeted attacks. We're not talking about just indiscriminate internet-wide attacks. So in terms of threat model, um, often at these kind of conferences, people like to stand up and say, you know, the sky's falling and whatever we've found is like the worst thing in the world ever and try and get some press out of it. Um, specifically with this level of attack, um, really is, is focused on sophisticated adversaries. And if that, they're not included within your threat model, if your threat model doesn't need to compensate for Mossad, um, probably not going to lose sleep over the fact that uh, the EFI is not being updated in the way that we would expect. And we'll dig into that more later. But having the context of a threat model is important when you're thinking about uh, new work that's being discussed. So. We've spoken a little bit about the um, historic EFI work that others have done. Um, this is like the highest level, quickest overview of, of some of the biggest um, work that's been in the space. Um, kind of all started with Snare, uh, a, a US black cat, uh, back in 2012. Um, he did some of the first work showing that a doctored Thunderbolt adapter could be used to um, overwrite and inject arbitrary code into EFI. This was the first work that, well, I'm aware of at least, um, that took um, the start to take place there. Um, and then we're kind of jumping around in timeline. So Sonic Screwdriver, this was out earlier this year as part of the Vault 7 kind of WikiLeaks dump. Um, it, it is common, uh, is the commonly believed knowledge that this dump reflects something that came out of the CIA. Um, and also from uh, all the analysis that have been done on the areas, um, it, people believe that this work, the, the Sonic Screwdriver work, was really a weaponized implementation of what Snare spoke about in 2012. Um, then we start to get like a couple of years uh, ahead. Uh, Trammell Hudson is going nuts uh, with Thunderstrike 1, uh, really extending on a lot of what Snare did. Thunderstrike 2 uh, took it to a whole new level because now this was a software-based attack. Up until this point, uh, Sonic Screwdriver, Thunderstrike 1, uh, Snare's original work, um, this all required physical access to the system. To plug something in, abuse some DMA privileges, um, take advantage of some problems with e EFI, and then get your code running in the EFI. Um, Thunderstrike 2 took that into the software domain. You didn't need to have physical access to the system. You could do it all from software space, which is pretty impressive. If you're not familiar with this work, um, that's Trammell, Zeno, Kova, 
uh, and Corey Kallenberg. Uh, check out the work. It's, it's an incredibly elegant uh, piece of research. And this took it into the software space. And really, at this point, and Papine will go into this a little bit more later, Thunderstrike 2 was a point in time that Apple significantly changed the way that they approached patching EFI and how seriously they took EFI security. So that's definitely a line in the sand. Um, Ulf Risk has also done some amazing work, um, PCI Leech and a lot of the DMA attacks. Um, less focused specifically on uh, attacking EFI itself, but using some misconfigurations and um, some, some aspects of the EFI to get what he needed to do done. Um, really, this work, the PCIA, uh, PCI DMA uh, attack work, enabled him to extract a file vault 2 key from the disk. Um, so essentially circumventing full, full volume encryption, um, uh, the, the standard uh, uh, full volume encryption that comes shipping with Macs. Um, loads of other cool EFI research as well. Definitely check out uh, Pedro's work. Um, but if you want a background on, on uh, EFI security and a lot of the research that's been done so far, like check out these references. It's all fantastic work. Um, this was the background against which we wanted to measure how well patches were actually being implemented in the wild. So um, now that we uh, have a little bit of a background of what we're trying to protect against and why it is important, um, we wanted to uh, you know, understand uh, how, how Apple uh, patches their systems uh, against all of this. Um, so like Rich said, 2015 was kind of a watershed moment for Apple. Uh, they needed to be, uh, get a lot more serious about EFI updates. Prior to that, um, EFI updates were a manual process. Um, uh, there was a separate applications. The end user downloads, runs. It gives instructions on sh uh, shutting the Mac down, starting it back up, holding, holding down a power button, waiting for a long beep, et cetera, et cetera. That is not very scalable when you manage tens or thousands of, uh, of Macs. And um, it was mostly ignored by most folks that, um, uh, that, that uh, either home users or anyone who manages Mac fleets, because it's kind of cumbersome and not really, uh, uh, it doesn't, it didn't get a lot of attention from Apple. Um, 2015, um, or the after Thunderstrike era, um, so I like to call it, Apple needed to make some changes because they needed to get this stuff out there and not just wait for, uh, for users to, uh, to go through this uh, system. So um, <clears throat> since then, Apple has shipped uh, uh, EFI firmware updates together with OS and security updates. How that works is that they embed a separate uh, standard Apple PKG a package installer inside the OS installer that contains all of the um, uh, EFI bundles, either SCAP or FD bundles. Um, in the process of applying an OS or security update, this uh, this updater also runs and uh, through a number of invocations of, of uh, spe specific tools that are uh, built for this EFI update is one. Um, it actually lines up, it checks whether an update needs to be done and it lines up an update if so. Um, and um, in a more graphical um, uh, exp uh, explanation of this, this is kind of how that works. So the larger uh, OS install um, fires off the firmware update, uh, kicks off a post install that does the work of determining whether an update is required and uses the blast command to set some NVRAM uh, variables as well as copying the updated EFI um, firmware payload to the uh, ESP volume call, uh, called uh, volumes EFI on, on, on Mac OS. And once that's all done, it waits for a reboot and the next reboot, um, a uh, EFI updater application actually uh, boots and does the work. Um, Important to, uh, to note here that this is a one-time deal, so the uh, updater gets one chance, and if it doesn't, uh, doesn't work, um, as we see later, there's not much, uh, uh, not much uh, uh, visibility into that. Um, so how does that updater actually figure out what to install? Uh, I said there's a number of files uh, from uh, uh, payloads that ship. How does the updater figure out how that works? So um, they have to ship a lot of these payloads. Uh, does every model have its own file? How does this work? Um, does somehow the EFI payload contain this info, and, and how does the updater know? So um, uh, a real quick breeze through how Apple um, can tell models apart. So uh, you may know of the uh, slightly more um, consumer-friendly way of um, uh, identifying Macs. They use a, a model name and then a number that uh, kind of ticks up with either a uh, generation, so 17, comma 1 in this example. Uh, they may do a comma 2, comma 3, depending on s sometimes screen sizes, sometimes some other CPU configurations, um, but those overlap. They may, uh, they may um, refer to multiple different generations of, of hardware. So what Apple uses internally is called the board ID, which is a, uh, an 8 or 16 character hex string 
uh, prepended with the Mac Dash, and those are actually unique to every mo model that they ship. So that that is how um, Apple keeps track of what um, what models. And if and when you see, when you look down here, you can actually see that um, um, the iMac oh, used to have a laser. Anyway, iMac 70 comma one actually covers three different board IDs. So it's important to know that that is uh, uh, not specific enough. So how does the uh, EFI updater actually figure out what to use? So the EFI uh, uh, payload actually contains board IDs in uh, a specific GUID. So in this case, uh, this GUID here, um, t we just cracked open EFIs and started looking for references, and that is where they are uh, stored. So there's a header there, um, and eight byte chunks uh, uh, are basically used to uh, uh, record the, uh, the compatible board IDs for these, which are done uh, grabbed by the uh, IO registry API. And if a match is found uh, between the system the updater is running on and that which is contained in the EFI payload, we have a match. And um, uh, there is a little caveat here in that some models, uh, two different physical models, use the same EFI bundle. And that is covered by the fact that um, the, uh, this particular GUID can hold up to 15 board IDs. So if there's more than one listed, that same single payload file actually applies to multiple um, multiple models. So that is how they kind of try to uh, constrain how many actual physical files they need to, uh, to ship. For QA reasons, we find out later that um, that can also uh, get into some trouble. Um, uh, visually speaking, this is kind of how this works. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the tool runs, does a check of the uh, board ID of the running system, iterates over the EFI files, uh, figures out which one is the matching one, and uh, does the rest of the work of assigning the EFI firmware. Um, which ultimately uh, uh, ends in a reboot and uh, application of the, uh, the firmware. Um, we updated this uh, this research also a little bit uh, with some uh, some of the new uh, new things found in 1013 uh, regarding EFI. So Apple is shipping a new tool called uh, EFI Check. Um, this tool is not meant to actually uh, check uh, version mismatches. It is an integrity checking tool. Um, Zinokova, who was mentioned before, is now on the other side of the fence. He now works for Apple trying to improve their EFI picture. Um, and this is one of the first things that he, um, uh, that he worked out. He actually had a, uh, a pretty lengthy uh, tweet storm before he had to probably delete it, um, where he tried to explain what this sort of like inscrutable dialogue that may come up on your, on your Mac under 1013 actually means. So EFI check has a uh, whitelist bundle of um, checksums of all known EFI to Apple, and it turns out Apple knows about a lot more EFIs than even we know about. Um, if that checksum somehow doesn't match, you get a dialogue as seen below there that says you have, might have a potential problem. Would you like to submit this to Apple? That would actually submit the, uh, the checksum to Apple so that they might um, uh, augment their data, or possibly because there is code in there that's not expected. But generally speaking, Apple is working on making this um, you know, getting more visibility as well as making this a higher priority, uh, showing that EFI is actually on their uh, on their uh, list of things to uh, to worry about. So uh, UX not great yet. Hopefully this will get better over time, but they have some privacy issues to deal with as well. They can't just grab this data and uh, exfiltrate that without telling you. So that's uh, that's what they're doing. Um, because of 1013, uh, APFS was rolled out across the board. Um, they had to update some models that had not seen any updates since 2015. So um, they needed to ship an uh, updated or an, an additional DXC uh, driver, essentially, in order for AFI to actually be able to read from APF APFS volumes. So this means that a couple of models that uh, so far had not gotten updates yet got updates uh, in the models of their uh, older iMac, MacBook Pro, and the Mac Pro. Um, the Mac Pro is a special uh, special case because uh, it is not able to be updated automatically. It actually has to fall back to the manual uh, 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 the manual procedure that I referenced to before. Um, what this means is that when you install uh, Mac OS uh, 10 uh, 1013 on these machines, they will actually show this dialog below that make you go through the manual system again. So you actually have to. Um, uh, click the shutdown button, hold down the power button on it again, wait for the beep so it kind of falls back to that. Um, but that's a one-time thing. doesn't quite scale as well either, so we'll see how that works out in the field. And um, it just basically goes through, detects the model, checks the EFI version, loads a, a plug-in that deals with this, and then does the same blessing as before, but it is a manual process. Those are some of the new things in, uh, in 1013 that we, uh, that we found. We didn't find any security updates that we can tell in those uh, EFI updates for those older models purely uh, aimed at APFS um, uh, compatibility. Rich? 
So that was a lot of EFI background as well as Apple EFI background, and we realized that's kind of like a blitz. So um, go back over the slides and kind of dig in on, on particular GUIDs if, if that's the kind of thing that you're into. So now we've got the context out of the way, what the hell did we do? So like I say, a lot of what we were looking at was to shine some light into firmware security as, as opposed to software security. Um, and so a lot of, you know, any research starts out with hypotheses and questions, and these are a bunch of our questions. Um, you know, Papine walked us through how the EFI uh, updates uh, are contained within the larger OS and security updates released from Apple. Um, do they work? You know, when, when, when we try and install them, do they take every time? Um, are equivalent EFI updates released for all supported hardware, or is some hardware treated differently than others? Similarly, are some versions of the OS treated differently than other versions of the OS? Um, EFI is independent of the OS, so there's no reason that if a vulnerability is being addressed in EFI, uh, for, uh, for, for a particular problem that's been found, that should be equally delivered across you know, any version of the OS that Apple has continued to support. Um, and then obviously, you know, we can see what Apple is releasing based on different hardware types, based on different OS types. Um, what we're also interested in is then the real world when people have actually um, you know, updated to whatever version of the OS, like, what is the state of their AFI? So does the real world match the ideal world? And um, if any of the answers to these things above um, return a no, then how easy is it for users or administrators of Apple fleets to actually work out that their EFI is divergent and possibly vulnerable, and then kind of what to do about it? So these are like a lot of the high-level research questions that we entered, thing, uh, entered into the work with, and um, that, led kind of, that led our direction of, of where we walked through things. So what was the analysis that we conducted in words that go off the bottom of the slide? Um, we analyzed every single OS security and firmware update that Apple released since 10.10. So that's like three and a bit years worth of, 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 of updates. Um, and we extracted all of those updates out. And then um, from that package that Papine mentioned earlier, the firmware update PKG, within that package, there can be tens to hundreds of EFI updates within there. Um, in parallel with this, we also got real world data from over 73,000 systems, um, obviously Apple systems. Um, so that we could see the um, state of EFI uh, actually installed in the real world um, and then compare and contrast this idealized data set to the real world data set. Um, and we also had many, many conversations with all sorts of people, including Apple themselves, to try and both understand and verify the results that we were seeing because we were quite surprised by some of those results. Um, and in a more graphical form, uh, we extracted out all of the updates from uh, the EFI updates from the OS and security updates. Then we built a data set of triplicates. So the build number, the build number is a way to uniquely identify any particular version of um, OS X or, or Mac OS. Um, the numbers that you will hear thrown around more often, like 10, 12, 6, um, are fine when that is the most recent version of the OS that Apple is supporting. As soon as it flips into security updates, so now 10, 13 is out, 10, 12 is flipped into security updates. So its version number will forever sit at 10, 12, 6. And it'll be 10, 12, 6, and then security update 2017, 001. Um, a build number will identify exactly which patch level you're on. So from, uh, we extracted the build number, the board ID, as Papine also mentioned earlier, the board ID is the only way that we can specifically identify um, the, the model of hardware uh, which is being referenced by the EFI update. Um, EFI is very, very specific to the hardware. So if you took one EFI and tried to install it on a different system, you would likely break that system and it wouldn't reboot. So um, we have the OS build number that specifically identifies the OS version. We've got the board ID, which specifically identifies the hardware version. And then we've got the EFI version. And it's that triplicate between those three that we build up our data set from. Um, each, of, each of these, um, for, a, for a particular version of the OS on a particular model of hardware, there should be a single version of EFI um, which is the most recent version that that should install. And we can declare that because those versions of EFI are shipped in the OS and the security updates, which ties them one-to-one -to, -one to a particular build number. Again, this is what makes the analysis on the Apple side much, much easier than on the Wintel side. So once we've got that data set, um, the first step of analysis that we do is re really we looked for anomalies in the EFI firmware that Apple had released, and we found a number of them. Um, the second phase of research is then gathering a similar data set from real-world systems. So again, we're building up exactly the same triplicate, 
We're getting the build number from uh, the, the real world Mac. Uh, what, what version of the iOS is it running? What's its board ID? What's its hardware version? And then what version of the EFI is running? Now we've got two comparable data sets. We compare those data sets, and the second step of analysis is looking for discrepancies between these two data sets. Then there's some profit or conclusions, and then the plant names are happy. So, building up a detailed picture, like I said, there's these triplicates. Um, this, is, this is a typical build number. This is uh, 10, 12, 6, I think. Uh, the first two digits are the, the major version of the, of the OS. And then the last ones, uh, the last three, are really just uh, an incrementing build number. Um, Mac model and board ID, um, as Papine also explained earlier, and then the EFI version. Um, there's no, uh, you know, is the naming of the EFI files um, is often named to match a particular model of hardware. But as was mentioned, um, some, some EFI files will actually um, apply to more than one Mac model if they're essentially internally the same. Um, so there's a good rule of thumb, but not to be, not to be completely trusted. Um, and in like, human language, this is 10, 12, 6, 27-inch 5K, late 2014 iMac running EFI uh, version 0207 build 29. So these are, the these are the triplicates that we built up. And then we uh, tabulated. This is just like a snippet. There's uh, more of this data in the paper that we released. Um, but we tablet, uh, tabulated up all of these triplicates over all of the updates and all of the versions of um, uh, Apple hardware uh, over the period that we were looking at, which is 10, 10, 10, 11, 10, 12, and 10, 13. Um, and we used these kind of big ass data sets to start to look for the anomalies. Some of it was um, pretty manual, some of it was automated. Um, the second phase, now we are looking into analyzing data from the real world system. So that first phase was just looking at what Apple had released. The second phase is looking at what's out there. So um, through, friends, uh, through friends of Papine, um, we managed to get uh, data from 73, over 73,000 systems. Um, of those 73,000 systems, um, 54, almost 55,000 of them were running 10, 10, 10, 11, or 10, 12. At the point in time when we were doing this research earlier in the year, these were the 10.12 was the most recent version of OS X uh, or Mac OS, and 10.11 and 10.10 were the versions that were still seen as security supported by Apple. So we constrained the real world data set to systems that were running 10.10, 10.11, or 10.12. Quite honestly, if you're running a version of, of, of OS X that's older than 10.10, EFI security is the least of your problems. So we cut down this data set to about 55,000. And um, like we say, because of this one-to-one -one pairing, because the EFI versions are included within the OS um, updater itself, if you're running OS version, let's say 10.12.6, we know exactly which EFI version should be running on 10.12.6 because it was bundled with the OS update. So we can start to ask questions around, um, from this data set, which combinations of OS and hardware are running an unexpected version of EFI because there is no reason that an EFI should not have updated because it came bundled with the OS. Um, and so we have two similar data sets we compare and contrast. We did things like big visualizations to try and help us, um, given the size of the data sets that we're working with. Um, this is just supposed to be pretty. Um, the yellow bobs are, are like uh, the areas that were being highlighted that we then dug in and did more manual analysis on. So what did we find? Everything is cool. No problems. Everyone go home. Um, no, we found some things. Um, so we found a number of things. First of all, real world, real world systems are uh, out of date or out of sync as far as what they, uh, what they are uh, expected to be. Um, also, we noticed that um, the security updates that are sent out after, uh, after, OS, uh, after the OS version shifts a, a full number um, also gradually drops the EFI model support uh, that, that comes with it. It's not, not something that's really publicized by Apple. Um, also, quiet failures, lack of visibility. So, uh, like I said before, if it doesn't if it doesn't go through, there's no way of finding out other than go going to look for the information. And we also find, found some unexplained um, update regressions where uh, Apple seemed to ship the wrong things at the wrong time. Um, so, successful update does not mean successful firmware update. Um, as said, the um, uh, the EFI updater gets one chance to get it right, and if that doesn't go through. Um, 
it simply uh, it, it simply uh, gets gets out of sync. So uh, we gathered uh, data from various EDU enterprise organizations who are uh, who uh, submitted to us as, uh, the, the data as, as mentioned um, uh, anonymized. We, there was really no way we, we uh, smushed it all together into one data set, um, and we got the uh, the data that would help us uh, compare that. Um, and then we uh, we measured some uh, some non non compliant records there. And the question was, which model X with o OS version Y has an EFI version that is older than it should be according to our uh, according to our lookup table? And we found that overall, uh, across all um, models and OS versions, 4.2 percent were running an incorrect EFI version, meaning older than what they should be. Um, it's a pretty significant number. It's not mind blowing, but it's also not in the uh, the very low uh, uh, tenths of a percent. So 4.2 percent, and this breaks out. Uh, across the board, kind of uh, differently. Uh, most up, uh, out of date model was actually a pretty recent iMac model that was almost 43% uh, of those were out of date. And um, the then current OS at the time, uh, when isolated for just 10, 12, was actually 10% out of date, which uh, you know goes up in, in on the on the concerning scale. And then 10.11 um, was out out of date 2.1%, and 10.10 10, uh, 3.4. So it seemed to kind of uh, go back and forth as far as uh, out of date numbers, um, and um, this is this is a, a capture from from our uh, from our paper. It, it, it's all listed in there, so feel free to uh, go check that out as well. But this lists uh, by no, uh, by model number the um, the most out of date systems. And if you uh, look here, you can see that actually uh, some of these uh, some of these are pretty new numbers uh, models, especially the MacBook Pro 13.2, which is the 2016 Touch Bar uh, MacBook Pro. Was particularly um, out of date for um, for unknown reasons, really. Rich. So, the previous set of findings indicated that there's some problems with the way that the firmware update bundle is getting installed or not getting installed. So, the OS update ver worked. The EFI version is not at the expected level because, for some reason, that EFI update didn't take. Um, <clears throat> but we can also be in a different a different way of being insecure. There's a different state that we can be in which is software secure but firmware vulnerable. So as mentioned, um, Apple tends to support the current latest version of its OS and then the previous two. So right now, 10.13 is the most recent. 10.12 and 10.11 are considered still under security support. And being still under security support, they will get issued security patches. So that's the security updates that you see being released alongside 10.13.1. We'll also come out with um, uh, a security update for 10.12 and a security update for 10.11. Um, so it's this kind of like N minus two rule. Um, and this deprecation cycle, um, Apple don't really officially say that this is what they do, but this is what they've been doing for years and this is what people expect. Um, so the question was around kind of, if you're still supported in terms of getting security updates for Apple, um, uh, in, you're on, on, a, on one of these N minus one or N minus two OS versions, are you still getting uh, firmware updates? And so we ran the numbers uh, on, on that, and um, the numbers are pretty damning, are, are, we, are we fair? So if we're looking at uh, models of Mac, so these big green numbers are the models of um, Mac that received an EFI update within that firmware update bundle within the OS update. So we can see um, at the time of this analysis, 10.12 was the latest version. So we can see that within the latest version of, uh, of 10, 12, 6, and then these are the two security updates, there were 43 models of Mac that received an EFI update. Um, there were 31 models of Mac that received an EFI update for 10, 11, and there was only one model of Mac that received an EFI update for 10, 10. So to our question, um, are all versions of OS treated equally? Um, absolutely not. Um, the older your OS, the less likely it is that you're able to see or you will receive EFI updates. I'm going to dig a little bit more into that um, in a bit. Um, so this is, this is quite worrying. There's no reason that uh, uh, Yosemite should not receive an EFI update because the EFI is independent of the OS. So if there's something to change here, um, there's no reason that it shouldn't be across the board for all supported OSs. Um, this is just one snapshot. Um, pretty much every update saw this trend and, and, and followed that trend. Um, and a patch for one doesn't mean a patch for all. So um, digging into that more, well, cool. You know, there may only be um, you know, 31 versions, um, models of Mac that are seeing an EFI update for 10.11, but uh, what, how does that really map against real-world vulnerabilities? So 
Uh, coming back to the research that we cited earlier, we pulled out these four CVEs. These four CVEs are specific against um, known EFI vulnerabilities, Thunderstrike 1, Thunderstrike 2, um, uh, uh, Ulfrich's CMA attack, and then another uh, attack by Xenokova that hasn't got a snappy name. Um, it was basically just uh, being able to abuse uh, unused EFI functions. So when we mapped these uh, four CVEs to the updates that were being released by Apple, we wanted to see which models were, being, um, were receiving updates to address these vulnerabilities. And um, these big numbers here now are the number of models that did not receive an EFI update to address these vulnerabilities. So Thunderstrike 1, which is the, the oldest one discussed, there were 47 models of Mac that never received an EFI update to address that vulnerability. 31 for Thunderstrike 2, 25 for Xenokova's uh, misuse of, of unused AFI functions, and 22 for Ulf Frisk's um, DMA, uh, DMA attacks. So again, this is quite surprising, right? These are, these are public vulnerabilities that have got a CVE number um, that Apple have patched for some systems, but not for others. And the kicker here is that while the release notes for uh, an OS update or a security update coming from Apple will reference these CVEs, will say that there are fixes included there. They don't actually tell you which model that they're included for. And then if we break down to the previous slides where we're discussing the differences between um, versions of EFI that were being patched on different OSs, now we can see why we needed these triplicates of hardware version, OS version, and you know, was an EFI update released. So you know, this, is, this is pretty worrying. We were surprised by this. Um, we were expecting a much more consistent level of patches to be released when it was a known security vulnerability, as opposed to just maybe some, um, some bug or some update to the EFI environment itself. And uh, <clears throat> we also uh, isolated a number of models that we call EFI orphans. Uh, what that means is that um, <clears throat> uh, up till 1012, the build numbers, uh, the last part of the, uh, of the uh, EFI version here, the build number, would steadily tick up um, into the 20s, 30s. Um, there are a number of models that uh, ship from the factory, generally speaking, with low build numbers, 0001. Uh, we found a number of models that, um, over the course of their, uh, their life, uh, never change the build number. So uh, other, other models would slowly get increasing build numbers uh, you know, sensibly because uh, th uh, patches were included. These models never saw anything uh, other than what they shipped from the factory with. And um, we, uh, we broke that down to um, models that not, didn't receive any uh, EFI update, so they were still at, at build 00, or they stayed the same across the, uh, across the, the, the timeline or models uh, with only EFI versions, uh, factory EFI versions, so um, uh, measured at when they actually shipped uh, to the world, those versions also didn't change. So 16 of those uh, models uh, never received any EFI dates, and then uh, 18 um, were, uh, were left with their factory EFI versions. Um, it's, it, it, it could be because Apple didn't deem them necessary to get updates or simply because they were left behind. It's hard to tell, but there were, Quite a few that uh, that never uh, never saw um, updates there, um, and uh, this is uh, this is an overview of that uh, of that table. So these uh, these numbers are um, <clears throat> uh, real, based on uh, based on real world data. This is a, a snippet from the from the paper as well. We have a full data set in there, so um, you're welcome to uh, check that out in, in greater detail. Um, and then, of course, because these updates are silent, um, they will also fail silently, as we as we said before. Um, because Apple needed this, this to work at, uh, at, at opportune times when users already are rebooting because there's an OS update, they, uh, they rolled it into a sort of a slipstream system. Um, but it also means that it gets one shot, and if, the, if it fails, there's no, uh, no messaging to the user that anything was wrong. In fact, they will go and check to see if their OS version is now one more than it should be or, or whatever it said when they ran it. They see, oh, my version is up to date. It must be cool. Uh, let's move on. So that is, it's, it's a deceptive, well, not deceptive uh, in a malicious way, but deceptive in that you can't really tell if anything happened unless you know what to go look for. Um, and then it, it's not something an end user definitely will, uh, will go look for uh, because it is an unknown system. And really anyone who isn't uh, digging into this will, will never know to, uh, uh, to make this a case. So often EFI, as we see uh, from our numbers, EFI is, uh, is out of date. And, um, and we also found some QA issues, Rich. Well, we believe there are QA issues. That's, that's what we're asserting. Possibly. So through all of that offline analysis of 
all of the AFI updates that were included with the various OS updates and security updates, um, as we were tabulating these things out, um, there, was, there was this uh, particular security update. So uh, security update 2017-001. So the first security update of this calendar year for 10.10 and 10.11. We you know, exploded out those bundles to, to look at the EFI versions that were, were contained. And we found that uh, the EFI that was included in this secu these security updates was actually older than the previous version that Apple had released. So essentially, they were shipping deprecated versions of EFI with a newer security patch level. Um, and the updates that were included in this, in the 2017-001, uh, were actually exactly the same EFI versions. And, and it, I mean, code for code, we did the checksums over everything as the releases, uh, the EFIs that were released with security update 2016-002. So they essentially shipped a regression. And this is like, again, pulled from the paper. We can see um, really the, the B number here is what you're wanting to look at. Um, we can see, let's say, uh, an iMac 13,1. We can see in 2017-001, uh, it's got a build number of 09. Uh, for the previous patch, 2016-003, it had 10. And then in the, the previous but one patch, 002, it's back at 9. So basically, the firmware update package that was released with these security updates was exactly the same firmware update package that was released two versions before. So it's a regression. Um, we were surprised at this. Um, from our conversations with Apple, they seem relatively surprised as well. Um, the last time that we checked, um, these updates still actually con contain the old EFI firmware. Um, we reckon it's a QA issue, kind of it was just a model on the back end, you know, the wrong, you know, QA is hard at the best of times, QA on firmware I'm sure is harder. Um, the, the next question that should be popping up in your head is like, well, if anybody installed 2017-001, did they downgrade their EFI to an older version that potentially was vulnerable? Well, luckily not, um, but not through Apple trying. So. Uh, when you installed this, you went through the exact same process that Papine outlined earlier. Uh, the, the, the particular correct EFI was identified. Um, it was dumped into the EFI partition. It was blessed. Some NVRAM updates were done. Reboot was issued. And then control is passed back to EFI. So EFI is only ever updated from EFI. You never actually update EFI from the OS itself. So uh, the whole update process had put the old firmware file in place ready for it to be flashed. However, in the EFI um, preview environment where the update actually takes place, it does a variety of other validation and checks. Um, one of the validations it does is code signing, making sure the EFI bundle that you're looking to flash is actually authored by Apple. Um, you know, that's always a good thing before you flash your EFI. Um, it also does a date check um, or a version check um, deliberately to stop you being able to roll back to an old version. Um, so. While this, these old versions of EFI were set to be installed, um, some of the uh, security characteristics of the EFI update process itself saved us from kind of rolling back. You can set, um, you know, there's a parameter that you can set within an EFI update environment that basically says don't allow rollback. Um, the reason that you wouldn't want to allow rollback, why this is a good thing for security, is, for example, if I had compromised the system, um, I could then go through um, the standard Apple EFI update process to install an old version of EFI that I know has got a vulnerability, so then I can um, exploit that vulnerability and, and you know, get my code into EFI. So the rollback protection is a great security protection um, and, and protected users in this case from not installing old versions of the EFI. So the regression shipped, but um, it didn't actually have a negative uh, uh, impact for the users because of the checks that were actually in the EFI update environment itself. So um, not a big security issue. Definitely uh, interesting in terms of uh, looking at Apple's QA process. Yep. Uh, I guess that's, that's a slide that says words that I've just said with my mouth. So we'll, slip, uh, we'll skip by that. Uh, mitigations. So it's spoken about a lot of problems. Papine is going to tell you how to fix things and make everything right. <laughs> yeah, so um, because we kind of wanted to look at um, what is being done by uh, by Apple about these uh, these issues, um, what can we you know what can we uh, do about actually uh, helping folks to uh, to discover this and, uh, and 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 do some mitigation? So um, we'll go through this uh, real quick here. So upgrading to macOS 10 10.13 uh, is a is a good first step. 
uh, logging reporting, running updates out of band, and uh, also some of the things Apple is doing is helping, and this uh, refers uh, back to EFI check as well. So, um, of course, first thing you can do, because of aforementioned uh, requirement for APFS to have EFI support, if you um, uh, upgrade to uh, 1013, uh, you will get uh, another shot at um, you do, uh, running your EFI updates, uh, as well as you'll get the, the EFI check um, functionality as well to keep a closer eye on its uh, um, on its uh, integrity as well. Um, I hear you're thinking 1013, um, is that the one where you can get easy root access? Yes, it is. Um, Apple has patched that. Um, so they're kind of in a, in a crappy situation where um, right now 1013 is not looking so, so great. Um, but I would say um, it is still your best bet as far as like um, uh, support for EFI updates and ver various other mitigations for other issues that are outside of EFI. Um, to uh, to deploy this, and actually, um, we noticed that Apple start uh, started shipping these EFI updates with APFS support back in 10.12.5, actually before 10.13 released, and as well again in 10.12.6. Our um, our assumption or our our um, sort of uh, what we assume here is, which is another word for assumption, um, is that Apple knew that these updates don't always take, and if someone runs 10.13 and then their EFI doesn't get updated, they're basically stuck in the mud because APFS now cannot be booted from. So they started to kind of precede these EFI updates in the previous OS in the hopes that they would cover more systems before 10.13 went live uh, in full. Um, you can use a number of tools out there to actually get this information. Uh, I've listed a few here, OS Query, uh, Popular, Puppet Chef. Uh, uh, you can also use a good old shell script um, if you have a way to send those out to get the same information. I um, want to point out that um, the, uh, the, the folks at Trail of Bits are actually working on a, uh, an extension for uh, OS Query that will uh, check against uh, uh, the, uh, an API that we will talk about in a minute. Um, they are working on this. Go check it out. There's a, uh, there's a branch being worked on right now. A uh, very useful tool to uh, get this information across a larger fleet. Um, so what can you do? You can reinstall the OS or security update. Um, if you install the same one that was previously installed, you will not break anything. You will just get another shot at um, installing the, uh, the EFI. Um, you can do the YOLO option and, and create your own standalone installer. Uh, this is not something Apple recommends, so I will not recommend it in case you break it and come to me, but it is a way to, um, to do this as well. There's a, um, a link down there as well for a, a popular uh, system management tool that actually runs you through the, um, through the process. Rich, tools and API releases. So <clears throat> rather than just finding problems, we also like to try and help people uh, get to a better state. So we wrote a bunch of tools and have released some open source. Um, they come under the name Effigy. Um, can't take any credit for that. That's, that's all Papine. Um, the focus of Effigy was, and as, as we've saw, or as we've seen from uh, the data analysis that we did, it can be both difficult to get uh, at the versions of the data that you want, um, as well as then to um, infer, is this the correct version of the EFI that I'm running, or, or am I running an out-of-date, possibly vulnerable version? Um, you know, it took two researchers a good good three months to kind of compile and chunk through this data. Most teams, most sysadmins don't have that layer uh, level of time and um, would just like something easier. So we built a bunch of tools to, to help with that. Um, really at its core, Effigy is just a RESTful API that encapsulates the data set that we've built up and are continuing to add to um, on the back end. And there's a small client um, that queries that, sends out the right version numbers so you can get back, um, are you running the expected version of EFI, et cetera. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. It kind of identifies what version of EFI you should be running compared to the version of EFI that you are running. Um, certain uh, particular combinations of hardware, software that um, we know have EFI problems should be flagged up. Um, new stuff's getting added to it all the time. Um, it's on GitHub, so we'll send you the link in a, uh, it's on slide in a minute. Um, if, if and when you find bugs, please just raise them to us and we'll try and get them fixed as quick as we can. Um, it now supports 10.10 through 10.13. 10.13 um, 10, is a, a recent addition because we didn't have that data until recently. Um, and we built a lot of the tooling around trying to help uh, Mac admins um, deal with this at scale. So if you're, if you're dealing with you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of Mac systems and you're asking the question, which of them are running out of date vulnerable EFI, um, that can be a pretty big task. So we wanted to build the tooling to try and help those sysadmins kind of deal with it at scale. Um, so how does it work? Um, really, we're just pulling out five key bits of information. Um, the EFI ROM version, so that's the, the EFI version that we've been speaking of, 
OS build number that we've mentioned before, uh, the system board ID. So now we've got that triplicate. Um, this is the triplicate that then we compare to the data set. Um, we're also grabbing uh, the SMC ROM version. Uh, we're hoping to extend our research out into SMC um, work in future. So we want to start to build up a data set of that. And then we also include a hash system UUID tag. Um, we wanted to call this out because people can sometimes get a little bit nervous about SysUUID because it uniquely identifies a hardware platform. Um, we wanted to do this so we could aid uh, analysis on the back end, so we could see repeat people calling the API and, and disambiguate them. Um, so we uh, essentially blind hashed uh, the system UUID. So we take the system's MAC address, we concatenate with the system UUID, and then we SHA-256 it. This means that we're going to get unique values so we can um, disambiguate the data on the back end, um, but we have no visibility to either the secret salt that's used or to the UUID. So it's pseudonymous, and, and this enables our data analysis, but doesn't infringe any, uh, any PII or, or, or any uh, identifiable information. Um, the API server itself isn't really a server. It's, it's um, a big chunk of Python built on top of uh, uh, an AWS. It's a big, fat AWS Lambda, really, um, built on top of the Chalice framework. If you're not familiar with the Chalice framework, check it out. It's super cool. Um, allows you to take a big chunk of Python and make it in a, into a server that automatically scales, so that's nice. Um, and we've got like a pretty nice uh, backend tool flow where uh, all of that analysis um, and extraction of the EFI updates from the OS updates and security updates kind of happens automatically. Um, and we've got it to the point that really the server code is actually written um, as an output from that analysis itself. So things are just running in the background. New server code is being uh, spat out all of the time. And the RESTful API is like super straightforward. So if you look at the client on GitHub, it's, it's super, super straightforward. You could easily write your own client. Um, Papine mentioned um, there's an OS query module being built um, to directly query against the API and, and not have to use the uh, effigy client. Uh, it's got a command line version, which looks really exciting. Um, you know, you'll see what's being sent up and then um, various checks that are being done. Uh, there's a GUI version if uh, people the, the CLI version is much better for its scale. The GUI version is great if people just want to kind of check their own home instance. Um, there's also a web app version that's great for the same thing. Um, and this is something that we wanted to share. Uh, the the uh, Effigy API data um, we've been gathering on the back end specifically to answer some questions of, you know, was our initial real world data um, reflective of, of like most normal people's use of it? So. Um, over the time that we've released the API, we've had about 133,000 queries, which is a pretty good data set, um, uh, from about 9,000 unique uh, endpoints. So that's 9,000 of those pseudonymous identifiers. Um, the interesting thing here, and this is probably the big takeaway, um, we were expecting the number 4.2% was the average that we cited earlier that was out of date from our real world data set. Um, from the effigy data that we're getting, it's actually looking more like 20% is the average number of people that are running unexpected versions of EFI, given their hardware version and their OS version. This is much higher than we, we had expected. Um, and here's some specifics about which model and OSs are like most out of whack. Um, uh, interestingly, the, the uh, number of systems running 10.13 is actually much lower than we expected. So here's some pretty graphs. Um, you can see that 10.6 is the most installed version of the OS that's hitting the API, and it drops off pretty rapidly from there um, with, with the most recent version of 10.11 following. We don't hit 10.13 until around here. Um, these are, this is across build numbers. Again, uh, this is just showing that 10.12.6, uh, the latest security update for 10.12.6 is the most prevalent. Um, the most uh, out-of-date model of Mac is a MacBook Pro uh, from about 2015, I think. Um, MacBook Pro 12.1. Um, this is a, a, a better distribution, um, but you can see a huge deviation between some models that seem to have incredibly consistent API, uh, sorry, EFI versions based on their hardware and their OS, and then some that are, are far more divergent. Um, we can't explain why EFI updates well and installs well on some systems and not on others. We can just observe the, the, the empirical data of that is happening. We don't know what the problem is that's possibly inhibiting these EFI uh, installs um, landing correctly. Um, and then this is, this is a different cut of data across um, uh, which is the most uh, prevalently mismatched EFI version. Um, we're going to release all this data um, so you can dig in and, and click around. So 
Uh, conclusions, we've covered a lot. Um, I think one of the key things that I, you know, certainly if you're working for a vendor here, um, being transparent with what you are and aren't patching is key, especially in the firmware space. It's, it's invisible to most users, and if you're not really explicit about what you are and aren't patching, um, the, the user's not going to know and is going to have to do a huge amount of work like we did. Um, we can absolutely be in states where we're software secure but firmware vulnerable. Um, not all hardware is treated equally by manufacturers, so don't fall into the trap that if one system was patched, all other systems will be patched. QA is clearly hard, regressions will ship. Um, and think about EFI less like a BIOS and more like a full mini OS. In almost every instance, the way that you would define an operating system, EFI meets that definition. It's essentially a mini OS that boots before it then hands over control to your full OS. So if we think of it like a, a mini OS, we need to treat it like a mini OS when we're thinking about patching and applying um, security updates to it. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we actually believe Apple is taking EFI security really seriously and doing a great job compared to many other vendors, despite the problems that we found. So there's a paper. Um, so, uh, this link here is going to be the latest version of, of the paper, which is updated for the 1013 data. Um, we've got a blog post and the effigy tooling. If you just go to effigy.io, you'll find everything that you need. I think that's a lot. Thank you.